Hello, bonjour, namaste, ni hao, and ohio, everybody. What is going on? It is Gale Riot here, and welcome back to the YouTube channel once again for another Don Machi video. And today, we are continuing to take a look at the behind the scenes of the anniversaries in Don Mimo, thanks to Fujino Omori himself. Of course, he's been giving us a little bit of an insight and background on all the anniversaries that have happened in Don Mimo. And today, we're going to be taking a look at the third anniversary, which is, a, of course, a stray record, and the fourth anniversary, which is Ada's Vesta. Now, if you haven't checked out my previous video where we took a look at the first and second anniversaries grand day and argonaut you can go and check out that video there will be a link at the end of this video that you can use to go and check out that video but of course in today's video it's all about one of the biggest anniversaries and in my personal opinion one of the most important anniversaries with of course australia record and a really cool but unfortunately a little bit misplayed and misunderstood anniversary in it as well so we'll talk about that when we get to it of course if you guys go on to enjoy this video please be sure to leave a like down below subscribe to the channel for more content and let me know your thoughts on on a stray record and a it is vesta down below in the comment section below what do you guys think about the uh the two anniversaries do you, did you guys like either one of them did you guys dislike one of them why did you like them why did you dislike them let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below i'm curious to see what you guys have to say down below now first and foremost we've got to start with the stray record we're gonna go in order of course that means that tomorrow we'll be getting the fifth anniversary and on monday the final anniversary or Gion saga or so12 will be taking place so of course we on look out for those videos as well but yes a stray record let's start with it a story of justice and evil seeking answers the second story in which scenario inflation has reached its peak it was so difficult and painful that i wanted to swear never to write a story of this nature ever again i remember being completely worn out along with ryu and the others so of course a bit of a hint as to how much ryu and a lot of the other cast members had to go through in this particular story because of course as the first line suggests right it was a traditional story of good versus evil, to be honest. It had its nuances as well. And trust me when I say this, there are a lot of nuances when it comes to the whole evil and good side as well. But a lot of it was just, you know, good versus evil at its core. That was the whole concept with a little bit of gray area in it. So it was extremely, extremely exciting to see them duke it out for effectively the, uh, you know, security and protection of Orario, basically to save Orario as a whole and uh, to save the peace era as a whole as well to see the our current cast members back in the past before bell ever was present before the hestia family was formed and so on and so forth what took place of course so it was very very exciting it also gave us our first proper look you know visually and everything of the Australia familiar which was amazing to see as well um because i think this took place around the time of the releases of volumes 12 to 14 in fact if i'm not mistaken i think volume 14 was dropping very shortly after Australia records release or just before i couldn't i can't remember exactly when it uh, dropped but it was around that time so we were getting basically a stray record, uh, a stray familiar information both in the main series as well as through Down Mimo. So it was kind of happening simultaneously there. Um, but yes, of course, uh, Omori goes on to talk about it here. I have so many feelings that for this that I can't even put into words. A stray familiar, Ardi, Zar, uh, and Althea, Erebus, Noir, uh, and many others. There were no supporting characters, everyone was the main character, and honestly. He's kind of spitting, to be quite honest. You know, he's kind of spitting. Every single one of these characters had their major role to play. And every single one of them was amazing, you know. Absolutely fantastic, uh, you know, selection of characters. And every single one of them had a important moment, which was the best part about the story, to be honest. It was amazing to see, in all honesty. I didn't have any pro trouble with Zard because I had the initial character setting already written uh, for Grand Day, which is quite interesting actually. So he had already set it up in Grand Day or he had planned to introduce Zard potentially through Grand Day. Of course, makes sense, you know, with the behemoth and him eating the behemoth to gain his powers and stuff like that or, uh, or his disease, I should say, more so uh, thanks to his skill and everything. We know how Zard would have been, you know, a part of Grand Day potentially, right? This is now very interesting because Omori wasn't sure if he wanted to add uh, Althea because, of course, the blood relationship between Althea and Belle and, of course, uh, Materia Mama as well, as he mentions there, you know, that would have been very complicated. And, of course, at the time, Belle wasn't present, right? It makes sense as to why still you would be hesitant because, you know, you bring in Althea who 
not necessarily looks alike to Belle, but very similar hair, hair color, you know, and all that sort of stuff. You could see why maybe Omori might have been a bit hesitant to introduce Alfia because how do you justify, you know, Belle and Alfia if, you know, people were to, you know, come up with the idea that, oh, wait, they're kind of related, right? So, yeah, that is something that is absolutely fair. But of course, with Materia not present, it made sense to kind of just introduce Alfia nonetheless because what else does Alfia have to live for? Materia has passed away. Uh, while Materia's offspring exists, uh, currently at this moment in time, Alfia is just too drowned in hatred. Uh, you know, following, of course, the loss of everybody in the Zeus and Hera Familia's uh, uh, plight against the uh, One-Eyed Black Dragon. And then, of course, you know, how Orario has, has Orario's standards have uh, you know dropped as well to be fair right that was the whole idea and then Erebus kind of manipulating both Zard and Alfia to kind of be the uh, the martyrs of Orario basically right the the people who will sacrifice themselves to better Orario effectively right um, so there is that as well right which makes sense now uh, of course we also oh that was a bit weird after I decided to release it uh, uh, release uh, a stray record I was put on hold but so I wrote a what if store scenario it became just as popular as the clown or Argonaut, and I was really surprised at the time. Also, GA Punko told me, hey, and I got angry. Uh, um, now, this is quite interesting. So, the what if he's talking about here is, of course, what if Bell was raised by Zard and Alfia? This is something that I think a lot of us, I have to concur with what Amori said, right? Here is that it's super popular. It's one of the most iconic what ifs for Danmachi. And it is probably one of the most used what ifs when it comes to fan fictions and, you know, what if stories that people like to write and continue on. Like, it, they like to use that as a basis, right? And I agree. I think this is a story that I would have loved to see in Dan Mimo as well. I would have loved an anniversary. One of the ideas I had for anniversary alongside the, um, you know, the idea that we could have had the elf storyline or the Leviathan story was that potentially having a story where we saw a Alfia raised bell take on Orario. You know, that would have been something else to see. Maybe not a full-length storyline, but the initial half. Who would, he, who would he have joined? Would he have still joined Hestia Familia? Even if he did join Hestia Familia, how much more well-prepared would he have been in terms of, you know, getting the, uh, you know, ground running? Would he still have gotten Liaris Freeze or a variant of Liaris Freeze? It would have been very interesting to see how it would have all panned out. And I would have loved to have seen what Amori would have done with that particular storyline as well. Very, very, uh, it would have been very promising. Very, very promising. The reason why I asked Yoshitsugu Matsuoka, of course, the voice actor of Bell, to play Erebus was because I wanted people to know the story that connects to Bell. However, this is rather selfish as there are some actors who deliberately create their characters without touching on the original work. So I was quite troubled by this casting decision until the very end. That's quite interesting. I thought it was a very interesting uh, decision to obviously play uh, put Matsuoka as Erebus, of course, right? Because... We already had Bell, we had Argonaut, which made sense. Both of them are like two sides of the same coin. Erebus was a very interesting character. I would say that you, uh, the more we learned about him, initially I was a bit skeptical, but I think the more we learned about him, and I'm quite surprised that he was still uh, kind of troubled by this, but I guess it makes sense, you know, when you know how well Matsuka does as Bell and how well he does as Argonaut as well, the, those characters are very different to Erebus. But at the same time, not really. Erebus is, to me, what he is, is that he shares very similar ideals as Bell and Argonaut in a way, but the methods to his madness are exactly that. It's madness, right? Compared to the likes of Bell and uh, Argonaut, who, you know, are heroes first and foremost, save everybody, save everything, we gotta go. Whereas Erebus feels like you have to go through hell and back in order to make sure people understand and to make sure things are done. Um, and, the, and of course, while he wants them to be done in a positive way, we know this because there, this is a debate that's had in the community as well quite often. Is, is Erebus's ideals, you know, legitimate? Did they do the right thing or are they, you know, still, you know, they, should they still be seen as evil right and that's where the whole good versus evil but a little bit of gray area comes into play right the evil side while they are evil their intentions are you could argue good right because of course they want orario to become better they want orario to not fall to the substandard that they know will uh, 
that they cannot afford to be at because of course if they do fall to a certain substandard they will lose big time they we already saw the they, these characters already saw the loss against the one-eyed black dragon they know what it takes and they know that the current orario was nowhere near capable of doing so so that push that they wanted to give here you could argue that intention was good the execution however is where the madness comes into play so it's quite interesting that, uh, you know, uh, Omori was a bit troubled, right? Because I think it worked really well because we could have seen a different dynamic of Matsuoka with Erebus, which we did see, which I really appreciated as well, that Matsuoka nailed it entirely, giving him a bit more of a, a villainous role, except not really completely a villain, because I feel like Matsuoka, right? We don't see him as a villain that much, you know? Most of his casting, you know, we look at other games and anime, right? Bell, uh, Kirito... Inosuke, uh, you know, Shao from Genshin and so on and so forth. He is one of those characters that always plays a hero role, be it even in, be it a more um, subtle hero like Shao or a more temperamental hero like, of course, Inosuke. And then, of course, you've got Kirito and Bell, the hero hero roles kind of thing, right? So it's quite interesting to, to see Matsuka play somebody a little bit different in Erebus, and he absolutely nailed it, in my opinion. I think he did a fantastic job there, to be quite honest. Um, but in the end, I decided to follow my desire and say, I want to see Matsuka as the final boss. And hey, boss, that was awesome. I agree. I absolutely agree. He nailed it. Absolutely. Uh, now, I'm going to translate this on my own because I feel like this is going to spoil something about Volume 18. And I don't want you all to get spoiled. So let me just see if I can uh, maybe get uh, this going so that uh, I uh, <laughs> don't spoil anything. See, I see Volume 18's light cover page, light novel cover page, and I'm already like, uh it's kind of suspect but i'm not i, I don't want to risk it i don't want to risk it so let me let me have a look at this okay um all right we uh one second one second i need to see this i don't think there's anything wrong with here uh okay ah okay so the this is all about why they wanted to go for it i thought that's probably what the third one will be like uh i thought about it a lot with the staff coming up with ideas for the title i think there were names like astraea memory astraea stardust but i think in the end we decided on the sound of the name and we decided to publish astraea record as a book why because of volume 18 and you'll see that later on trust me when i say this it's very important astraea record is going to link into volumes 16 to 18 more specifically volume 18 heavily so i keep keep in mind keep that in mind i would hear, highly urge people to go and read a stray record i'm gonna be making uh, a video on what you need to do in order to catch up with uh, a stray uh, with volume 18 and of course this season five of the anime which is of course going to cover volume 16 to 18 but uh yeah i'll be making a video on that because there are some sort of things that you should be also taking a look at as well so keep that in mind but yes that is all for of course a stray record in fact he actually tweeted out Funnily enough, Amori also tweeted out that, uh, uh, you know, he won't love to give more information about a stray record. One of the things he wants to do is he has so many more behind the stories, scene, uh, scenes, stories about a stray record. I even said, you know, we would love more info. It would be amazing. So hopefully he does do something in the future and does that. Kakage, one of the illustrators and actually the illustrator for the upcoming Danmachi game as well. He does the illustrations for, I think it is the Storatoria light novels. He asked... Will a stray record be made into an anime yet? And then, of course, Amori, please, please, Amori, Danmachi anime. He tagged Danmachi anime as well. Can you hear me, Danmachi committee members? I'm speaking directly to your hearts. We are going to make an anime of a stray record. kakage son is waiting and all the uh, fans are sitting upright too. A stray record will be made into a film and Argonaut too. Please make it into an anime or a film. I agree. Please. If this is going to happen, bro, if Amoy Sensei has managed to get through the committee members, listen, listen, listen. We are waiting. We are seated. We are ready. We are ready to go. We want it. We will eat, feast, dine upon it. I mean, hey, listen, Amori wants it. We want it. The illustrators want it. I mean, who else wants it? Nobody else? That's fine. It's all. These are the only people that need it, okay? So, SB Creative, J.A. Bunko, whoever it is, JC staff, listen, we need it, right? Season 5, let it happen. I don't care. We need this more. So, no, I mean, we, uh, of course, Season 5 is also very important. Don't get me wrong. But, uh, I, look, at the end of the day, after Season 5 is done, we really need to stop with the main series we need to do so we need to do sword oratoria or we do something like this we do a stray record or argonaut we could do a sequel to arrow of orion through aedas vesta of course we'll talk about aedas vesta in a moment 
you could do so many things. So please, Don Magic Committee members. Amori Sensei has said his piece. I've said my piece, and I think a lot of the comment section of this video and everywhere else on every other platform will also say the, say the same thing. So please, get it done. All right? Get it done. All right? Get it done. Now we move on to Ada's West. Uh, probably one of the most interesting, um, you know, storylines, to be honest. Because this is a pseudo-sequel to Arrow of, the Orion, uh, Arrow of Orion. And he even kind of mentions it here. A story that concludes the movie version together with the death, uh, the death of the gods. So... Like he says right here, it is literally a sort of like sequel to Arrow of Ryan, which is great, to be honest. And again, this is another reason why I feel like Aedis Vesta could be amazingly uh, placed uh, to be a good movie, in all honesty. A two-part, maybe three-part movie, you can get it done. We got a request from, I assume, the developers to put the spotlight on Hestia Familiar. Or I think, in, no, actually, you know who it might have been? It might have been the committee members. Because the thing is, right, with the way it works, right, if you look at Dragon Ball Z Dokkan Battle and other gacha games as well that have anime priorities, the the people who run the companies, right, the committee members and stuff, right, the higher-ups, the ones who own the publishing rights and everything, they're the ones who say, like, okay, we need you to release this unit. So, for example, in Dokkan Battle, um, they released PyCon, when in Legends, they also released PyCon, and then in Xenoverse also, they released PyCon. For some reason or another, they wanted to release those characters, right? And so, just like that, I assume that in this situation, the committee members must have been like, look, we need to make a, you know, uh, a story on the first year familiar. So we started production. This is actually the most difficult anniversary event. It's probably the biggest in terms of volume to date. Personally, I still feel a bit regretful that I could have done more. This was a very tough anniversary, to be quite honest. Not just for Amori in terms of writing the story, which I'm sure must have been uh, difficult, to be quite honest. We could see it was quite difficult. But two, COVID was happening at this point. This was during COVID. Uh, like, the year after COVID began, COVID was 2020, but the thing is, you, you have to realize that these anniversaries are prepared six, seven months in advance. So, a Australia record must have been well in development before COVID really did hit, right? But, unfortunately, Aedis Vesta was hit by COVID big time, right? You had uh, multiple parts without any voices purely because the VAs couldn't record it due to illness or, you know, inability to get to the production studio or whatever it may have been. Then on top of all of that as well, generally players were also getting tired of the game four anniversaries in. You know, the game wasn't seeing that much change at the time and a lot of people were a bit disappointed. I myself was a little bit, um, I was a little bit disillusioned to be quite honest. I was playing very inconsistently and infrequently. I did do my first ever video, my first ever Don Machi summons video on Aedis Vesta actually funnily enough as well. I think I went for and summoned for Vesta. But um... I can understand why this was probably one of the hardest anniversaries and how it must have been also a struggle for Amori to write this anniversary as well. Um, now, let's see this here. Hesed of Vesta is a story I was vaguely thinking about after the end of Danmachi. So, this is something that we kind of know about. Aedis Vesta is supposed to be some sort of like alternate ending, basically. This was one of the endings that Amori had planned for Danmachi as well. And I think it would have been cool. It would have been cool to have this as an ending. But of course, it does mean that this is definitely non-canon because it's just such an odd timeline. We still don't know Bell's levels and stuff like that. I pulled some ideas from it. At the moment, she is the strongest character in the Danmachi world when it comes to purification and protection. The theme song, Vesta, is one of my favorite Danmimo songs. I agree. It's my favorite Danmimo song as well. I absolutely adore it. I think it ended up coming... Uh, I don't remember what position it came in. But I remember they did a voting for like the best songs. And I think it came like top five, I want to say. Or third place. I'm not sure. But it is one of my favorite songs as well. Songs as well. He even uh, requested to play it in the fifth anniversary as well. Which is true. In Knights of Fianna, I remember like they... You, you had the stories, like, you, you had Saikyo no Uta, you had Fortia, uh, Fortia, and so on and so forth. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of a fight, that fucking Vesta starts playing. And I'm like, wait, what? Why is Vesta playing all of a sudden? I was like, wait, am I, did I go to the wrong event or something? <laughs> I genuinely thought for a split second I'd, I started the wrong event. And then I was re I realized, no, I'm, I'm in the 5th anniversary event. But, uh, yeah, so Vesta was also played in the 5th anniversary. Very, very good theme song, one of my favorites, like I said. Um... Then we move on to this. Uh, I really like Ilya's cute girl with a cute face on the back. Omori had a different idea. Uh, Omori, that is to say, he had a different idea for the visuals. 
but uh, the staff's enthusiasm pushed us to go with the current version. This was the right choice. I'm reflecting on the fact that there was a way I could have dug deeper into Episama. I wanted to see this pair interact more. I agree. I think Epimetheus needed a little bit more time. I think that was one of the weakest points. And his connection to Argonaut as well, I think, was not addressed really all that well, in my personal opinion. Um, and it's why a lot of people were a bit meh on it. And of course, the letter that uh, Omori put in the Argonaut special edition, which I uh, you guys can go and check it out. I've made a video talking about it. Um, that could have helped Epimetheus a lot so much more you know it would have helped him out so much more now this is quite interesting I remember being very excited about Aphrodite as a reaction to finally being able to publish the bonus novel that came with the movie Orion's Arrow I love all of my familiar members too and I left it up to the scenario writer and some serious quarrels were born which became legendary I think Aphrodite is the best goddess of beauty there you go from Omori sensei himself he thinks Aphrodite is the best goddess of beauty I personally disagree i prefer freya myself but in terms of familiars to join right so so many people asking this oh will you join freya's familiar and i'm like hell no i love freya but hell no i'm not joining her familiar <laughs> god no uh i'm a I i'll observe from afar <laughs> i'm a guy who will observe the beauty from afar but to be honest i i said i'll join hephaestus's familiar or if if aphrodite was more based in orario and stuff like that I'll join Afro Aphrodite's familiar, 100%, 110%. Um, I think though, uh, Aphrodite as a goddess is really well done. I really like her, to be quite honest. They nailed it. They nailed it with her, to be quite honest. Absolutely. I thought people were getting tired of the reinforcement scene at the end of the first part, which is a tradition for the anniversary. So I decided on the Apollo faint, uh, which, yeah, I could not believe the Apollo familia came out of nowhere for that story, man. It was insane. By the way, I love Apollo familia. I don't know about that one, Chief. Uh, love is a bit of a stretch. Uh, you know, love, love is a bit of a stretch. I remember that Artemis, aka Elpis, was a lot of fun to write. Uh, let's see this part now. In the second part of Tsukikage, uh, I actually did everything I wanted to do, but I ended up burnt out. There was so much I wanted to do in part 3 that I nearly gave up. Also, personally, I had a hard time to write because there were a lot of scenes that I was embarrassed to write. Fair enough. I mean, yeah, like I said, I think it was just a, such a tricky anniversary to do. But yeah, however, I was happy to hear many people say I love Hestia Familia the most. I feel the more I struggle, the more help I receive from the staff, cast, and everyone involved. I'm glad I was able to present the scenario. No matter how Ada's Vesta may have been flawed, I think it was a really solid anniversary still, to be quite honest. A really enjoyable anniversary with some amazing moments and some amazing characters as well. I understand, though, it that even through this, you know, you can tell that Amori still doesn't feel too comfortable with Ada's Vesta. And I do wonder if that if they ever get a movie for Ada's Vesta, maybe as a sequel to our of Ryan, I wonder if there's an opportunity for us to, you know, see Amori rewrite the story a little bit to make it better and to make it to what he wants it to be, to, to his uh, uh, vision, you know, more so. So let's see. Let, let us wait and see what happens there, basically. You know, let's see what happens uh, there, basically. But yeah, anyways, let me know what you guys think of the two stories in the comment section down below. I loved seeing this. And of course, hopefully, you know, the anime does happen. Fingers crossed, right? Amori wants it. We want it as well. Let's see what happens there. Thank you guys all so much for watching this video. Please be sure to leave a like down below. Subscribe the channel and i'll see y'all in the next one take it easy everybody bye bye